Jesus rose On that day We will see you Shining brighter than the sun On that day We will know you As we lift our voices one Till that day We will praise you For your never-ending grace And we will keep on singing On that glorious day On that day We will see you Shining brighter than the sun. Have you ever stopped to contemplate exactly what that will be like? To see Jesus face to face. To look in his eyes and see his love, his compassion, his grace. But I feel we've jumped ahead a little bit here and I want to give some background. So here's where we're heading today. See him and die. See him and live. So firstly, see him and die. Many people have said, and maybe you've heard it said, I would believe in Jesus if he would simply turn up and show himself. People think that they'd love to see God. But right throughout the Bible, we see that it is actually terrifying to see God. Do you remember the prophet Isaiah and the vision that he saw that he reports in chapter 6 of Isaiah? It's a humbling, remi humbling reminder that, in fact, we'd rather not see God. Do you recall? For it would be terrifying. Let me read to you from that chapter. Verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. He's enthroned. He's high. He's lifted up. This is no little God that is equal to us. He is in charge. We are not. This is a God who is bigger, better, higher, more exalted. We don't meet God as our equal. He is far and above us. Now, the temple in Jerusalem was a magnificent building in 740 BC. Huge foundations, magnificent timber work. And yet in this vision that Isaiah reports, he says the train or the hem of God's garment completely fills the temple. Uh, the hem on my trousers now is about two centimetres, maybe one. Yet in this vision, the hem of God's garment fills the temple. So we get, we're meant to get an idea of the proportions. If just the hem of his garment fills the temple, how huge is God? It's a vision, of course. But the lesson is, how huge is God? Friends, when you meet God, you don't have a nice, warm, glowing experience. No, you, you fall on your knees, trembling. And the seraphs, these angelic figures that we see, do you recall what they're crying out? Not love, 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 which is the way people love to betray God all the time. But no, they're calling out, holy, holy, holy. It's the song. It's a song sung to God and to Jesus the Lamb in the book of the Revelation. It means that God is nothing like us. He's separate from, different to us. God is unlike you, unlike me. He's in a completely different category. He doesn't think like we think or do the things that we do. He is completely other. And suddenly, Isaiah cries out in despair. Uh, chapter 6, verse 9. Woe to me, I cried, for I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. He says, I am ruined. The word, mean, the word uh, used there means unpicked. He says, I'm coming apart because I've seen the Lord God Almighty. My whole being is being torn to pieces. He sees God and he's immediately aware, aware of his sin, of his corruption. The understanding was, right back to Moses, that you could not see God and live. With your stain, your rebellion, your uncleanness, your unholiness, you cannot be in the same place as God. Isaiah figures that he has no right to live. Brothers and sisters, this is the terrifying holiness of God. We're all so casual about our sin and our state before God, aren't we? 
People think they're going to rock up to God and say, G'day, mate. No, friends, this is the reality. This is what God is like. If he were to turn up, we would just want him to go away. His holiness would be unbearable. And yet what we go on to see in Isaiah's vision is God's amazing grace. Something absolutely extraordinary happens here. A beautiful thing happens. One of these seraphs comes right up to Isaiah with a coal about to burn his lips, not to kill him, but to transform him. The seraph says to him in verse 7, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. It's one of those really difficult things to get our heads around with Christianity, that our sin is so absolutely, astonishingly serious, and yet God himself deals with it, atones for it, takes it away. We see clearly in Isaiah this wonderful, liberal, lavish, free grace of God, which says to Isaiah, you're forgiven. God will take away your sin. Like the tax collector in Jesus' story, who simply said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. And he went home right with God. Or like the son who admitted his unworthiness to his father and was welcomed home with a party. Or the woman who was aware that she'd been forgiven much and poured perfume over Jesus' feet. Or the woman caught in adultery whom Jesus did not condemn but, says, go, but said to her, go and sin no more. Like the millions of people over the course of the last 2,000 years who have come to realise on the one hand the horror of their sin, but on the other hand the beauty of forgiveness which comes through Jesus' death and resurrection. So with that background we can now turn to our extraordinary and wonderful Advent hope that we will see him and live. Now, look with me at Revelation 22. The passage is full of imagery, of course, but I want you to notice life in the heavenly city, a far cry from the earthly city right now. Have a look with me at chapter 22, verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, See the river of the water of life and the tree of life. Let's think about those two things for a moment. Uh, do you remember what Jesus promised to those who came to him? John 4, 13. Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Here is the absolute fulfillment of that promise. There's rivers of living water here in the heavenly city. Now, do you remember when Adam and Eve were put out of the garden in Genesis chapter 3, verse 24? After he drove the man out, he placed on the, on the east side of the garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So access to the tree of life was completely cut off. But now, what do we see here in Revelation 22? That the curse has been reversed. There's a tree on each side of the river. There's no longer any curse on humankind. And what is more, we are told that the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. That is, the pain and suffering of humanity throughout history will be no more. Now, let's pick up the passage again from verse 3. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face. We are his servants. We will serve or worship the Lamb of God. Jesus, the Lamb of God who has taken away the curse of our sin. And then do you see, we shall see his face. We shall see his face, yet we will not fear. We won't be thinking we're about to lose our life because we've seen his face. We won't be thinking like Isaiah did, that his face will be our undoing. 
or that seeing his face will be un our undoing. We shall see his face and live because our unholiness has been taken away. Our sin has at been atoned for and we will be perfectly renewed in the image of God. Can you imagine? Centuries of fearing that you could never see God's face and live. The full glory of God never available to sinful humankind. But on that day, we shall see his face. We will see his beauty and his glory and his majesty and his mercy. We shall see his love, his compassion, his understanding, his kindness. We will see Jesus, our Saviour, our Rescuer, the one who died and rose again. We shall see our Lord, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who has triumphed over evil one, over the evil one, and whose reign of righteousness will never end. Well, brothers and sisters, you may be sitting there wondering, okay, Mark, that's all very nice. But what's this really got to do with me and my reality? How is this going to change tomorrow? You won't believe my life right now. I'm hard pressed. I'm financially, I live with unbearable pain. There are family members from whom I'm estranged. The kids are driving me crazy and the holidays are only just starting. I need a job. Have you seen my medical bills? I can't even begin to think about Christmas. And you're telling me something airy fairy in the distant future about seeing Jesus? Well, I hear you. They're good, good questions. What difference will this make? Three things, all beginning with P. First of all, perspective. Advent is about lifting our eyes from ourselves, from our circumstances, from the muck of this world to the return of Jesus and the world to come. Sometimes when we're in the thick of things, it's hard to have perspective. So I like going out uh, up on Mount Panorama here in Bathurst. Because you sort of get the lie of the land. You get some perspective. Advent is meant to give us perspective. Yes, this world now is full of challenges. And not for a moment do I want to trivialise those. But there is a world to come which will be absolutely glorious. And when we stand on that day, we will be in awe and wonder at the new creation when we see Jesus face to face. And with that perspective, we see what really matters. Our relationship with Jesus, our, our forgiveness among all our needs, our greatest need has in fact already been met by Jesus. So perspective, then perseverance. The perspective helps us to persevere. You know, the Bible tells us through the Apostle Paul that all that we're facing now are light and momentary troubles. And when we have that perspective, that keeps us going because something better is coming. And now what we face is short and temporary. When you're putting in a long, hard day on the property or at work, uh, when you're helped to persevere, when you know the end is in sight, just one more paddock to harvest, just one more hour to see through, when the end is in sight, you can keep going. Friends, the end is in sight before Jesus returns. It may only be moments away when we shall see his face. So perspective, perseverance, and finally presence. Because that same Jesus, upon whom we look forward to gazing, is actually present now with us, in our struggles, by his spirit, dwelling within us. And his presence calms us guides us, empowers us, strengthens us. So cling to his presence, run to him, 
find refuge in him to keep going. Amidst the challenges of today or tomorrow or the weeks to come or next year, take time out to joyfully anticipate all that it will mean when one day we see Jesus and live. Jesus rose on that day we will see you shining brighter than the sun on that day we will know you as we lift our voices one till that